Welcome. We're so glad you're here. <laughs> I had an instructor talk about how she always feels like when you're letting people, everyone in, it's like, come on in, come on in. You're all filtering in. So let's just imagine everyone's coming in and taking their seats. We're so glad you're here. Um, we're going to go ahead and admit everyone. Um, so welcome, welcome, welcome. It's fun to see some familiar faces because we're this is our fourth hashtag TX book chat of this new series um, at the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. Um, so we're glad to see you. Just as a reminder, you know, your um, your video, we'd love for it to be on because we love to pretend this is a conversation. It's well not pretending, it is a conversation. Um, but you will not be recorded. Uh, we are recording, but you will not be on the recording unless you unmute yourself. So just feel comfortable and confident with that. Um, we do definitely see this as interactive. So please be typing in the chat the whole time. Um, we just, just, just dig in. I'm sure a lot of y'all are really familiar with Zoom culture. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, and our, our team here will get right on it. Um, just a little overview. Um, I'm Rebecca Manley and I'm the coordinator for the Texas Center for the Book. We seek to increase literacy, reading, and library use statewide. And we are um, with the amazing Texas State Library and Archives Commission. Um, and we thought we'd bring these, cha these chats to y'all so that we could just sit down and have a book chat. Um, make sure you grab your coffee. So I'm in a I'm going to make this intro really short because we all are here to see Don Tate. <laughs> Hi, Don. Hey. Um, so um, just get cozy, relax. Again, ask your questions. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce Don. All right, y'all, let's dig right in. So Don Tate is an award-winning illustrator of numerous critically acclaimed books for children, including Carter Reads the Newspaper, no Small Potatoes, Junius G. Groves, and His Kingdom in Kansas, Whoosh, Lonnie Johnson's Super Soaker's Dream of Invention, The Amazing Age of John Roy Lynch. He is also the author of Poet, The Remarkable Story of George Mo Moses Horton, and It Just Happened When Bill Taylor Started to Draw. Both books are Ezra Jack Keats Award winners. And most recently, Strong as Sandow, How Eugene Sandow Became the Strongest Man on Earth. Forthcoming titles, they're just around the corner, include William Still and His Freedom Stories, The Father of the Underground Railroad, which we're gonna get an inside look on today, and Swish, the slam dunking, alley ooping, high flying <laughs> Harlem Globetrotters, written by Suzanne Slade. Don is a founding host of The Brown Bookshelf, a blog detailed to books for African-American young readers, and a one-time member of the hashtag We Need Diverse Books campaign to create, created to address the lack of diverse, non-majority narratives in children's literature. He lives in Austin, Texas with his family. So that's the formal bio, and here's the inside scoop because I've known Don for over five years now. It's a joy to have Don with us today. I met Don through the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, SCBWI, and he'll tell you a little bit about that. And I have to tell y'all, Don is an integral part of our writing community here in Austin, in Texas and beyond. We are lucky to have him in the Lone Star State, and I appreciate his willingness to share his time with us today. Y'all are in for an incredible treat because he's going to share a sneak peek from his next book. So if you're new to Zoom or if this is your million Zoom this month. <laughs> um, please look at the bottom of your Zoom box. There's a little thing that says reactions and use these heavily throughout the presentation. So please join me in clicking on the round of applause button for Mr. Don <laughs> Tate. Good morning, Rebecca. It is such an honor for me to be here with you all today um, with an opportunity to talk about my forthcoming book, um, William Steele and his Freedom Stories, a father of the Underground Railroad. I feel like my time is very limited, so I am going to jump right to my presentation, share a screen. Go 
And so you should see my first slide. All right. So again, my name is Don Tate, and I am primarily an illustrator. Um, I've illustrated more than um, 80 trade and educational books in my 30 plus year career. But I'm also an author. Uh, I started writing later in my career. I started writing in about 2010. Um, I moved to Austin and I joined the writing um, organization, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators that Rebecca mentioned. And there I found friends and mentors who nurtured me and encouraged me to, to write my stories. It just happened when Bill Trailer started to draw became my first authored book that published with Liam Bo Books. And it won starred reviews and it won awards. And that gave me the confidence to continue to write for young children. So I want to talk about the inspiration behind William Still um, and writing that story. I have one of those moms who's always sending me stuff. Uh, you know how that is. And so she knows that I like to write and illustrate. So she's always sending me ideas. I'm like, mom, what am I going to do with all this stuff? But one day she sends me a copy of the Biographical Dictionary of Black Americans. And I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with this book, but I decided one thing, I'm just going to go through each of the pages and start sketching some of the people inside the book. One year during Black History Month, and I just decided that I was going to sketch one figure per day and post it to my social networks. And so these were some of the images that I sketched. And I always love introducing some of those unheralded African American figures. So beyond the book, I also looked um, in Google, found other images of African Americans. And, you know, I was inspired by the work of Condoleezza Rice, Rice just as much as I was the work of Dr. Martin Luther King and George Washington Carver. And I posted these images to my social networks and made this, these downloadable for free on my website, which you can find them there on my website today. So who was William Still? William Still, at the time of his death, was eulogized by the New York Times as the father of the Underground Railroad. He was a civil rights activist. When Black people were denied access to the streetcars in Philadelphia, William protested and he won. He was also a successful businessman. After he got out of the Underground Railroad business, he started a coal company and became one of the richest Black men of his time. So I said, yes, most definitely, this is a story that needs to be told. So this is the cover of the book. And I'm going to give you a, sh a short introduction. This story begins at a time when the United States was free. Or excuse me, this story begins at a time when the United States was split in two. In the North, Black people were free. In the South, they were enslaved by whites. Slavery was a nightmare. Backbreaking work under a scorching sun, threats of lashing or work or worse, no pay. Children were separated from their mamas and papas, brothers and sisters, sold away at auction, never to be seen again. Sometime during the 1700s, Levin and Sidney Steele were held captive on a Maryland farm, forced to work. Their four children were two. The family yearned to live free. I will die before I submit to the yoke, Levin told the man who enslaved him. The two came to an arrangement. Levin was allowed to work over hours, actually receiving a small income. With money earned, Levin purchased his freedom. But freedom wasn't always fair, especially to Black people. Could a free Black man remain in the South? Levin must have wondered. Might he be enslaved again? No chance in that. Levin bid his family a goodbye with a plan to return to rescue them later. In a blink, he bolted north. Sydney wasn't so fortunate. There was no opportunity for her or the children to purchase their freedom. They remained behind, still enslaved. A separation Sydney could not endure. 
Torn and tormented, she whispered a parting prayer for her two boys, who were big and strong enough to fend for themselves. Then she escaped with her two girls. Ah, my technology is not working here. It's not advancing. Come on, advance. Okay. It's okay, Don, take your time. Sorry, folks, my computer. I'm going to escape for a second and then probably have to reshare my screen because this is not no problem. Fancy. I think all of us understand, especially in 2020, how technology <sighs> can be a stickler. All good. Escape. Okay. This is really not doing anything. Okay. And I don't have any other way to advance. I don't know if there is any way that you have on your end that you can. Man, I'll just get there. Okay. Do you want to stop sharing your screen and maybe reshare it? Maybe stop. Ah, okay, oh, there oh, we go. Advanced. Suddenly we it's, go. it's working. Okay, we're going to go back. Okay. All, All right. Good. Cindy reunited with her husband in the Pine Woods near Washington Township, New Jersey. Now they were together, free as the wind. They changed their last name from Steel to Steel to throw slave catchers off. Their new life was good, but living ate like an open sore. Levin and Sydney longed for the two sons they had left behind. Over the years, the family grew. Now there were 15 children, 15 mouths to feed. Oh, how they struggled. Money was tight. Food was scarce, shoes, if any, were hand-me-down. In 1821, the youngest child was born. Sunlit eyes, mahogany skin, they named him William. He grew quick as a weed. Eight years later, a neighbor was attacked late one night. The man had once been enslaved in the South. He escaped and found peace in the pines. Slave catchers tracked the man down. They rushed at him, cuffed his arms, beat him badly. Thankfully, the man escaped, but he needed help, and soon the greedy men were still on the prowl. The neighbors, they called on William. The, bo the young boy knew every nook and cranny of those pine woods. William led the man to safety, some 20 miles away. The experience defined the remainder of his life. So be began the journey, a lifetime of helping people, helping freedom seekers escape north on the Underground Railroad system, helping to reunite families torn apart by slavery, and helping to rescue freedom seekers from cruel slave holders. And one of the things that I learned during my research was the term freedom seekers, because those first few drafts, I used the words fugitives and runaways, which are dehumanizing. So in my story, I chose to use the word freedom seekers because that's what they were. They were human beings who were seeking freedom. And again, my not wanting to advance. Note to self, figure out why this thing does not want to advance. It's all good. And if it does help to X out, that's fine too, Don. Uh, okay. Okay, there we go. Okay. Perfect. So um, at that time, um, freedom seeking people were attracted to Philadelphia. It was the nearest city to the slave holding South. So dozens of people were were escaping slavery and arriving in Philadelphia, and William Steele would welcome them into his home. He became a conductor, the top conductor in Philadelphia on the Underground Railroad system. And as they passed through his office, William would record the details about these people 
with the hope of reuniting them with their families torn apart. He recorded their names, their ages, whether it was a boy or girl, a man or woman, the hue of their skin, copper, chestnut, dark brown. But in addition to recording the details, he also recorded their stories, their personal stories. We know, and, I, and as I researched this story, I was already familiar with the story of William and Ellen Craft, an enslaved couple who escaped slavery while in disguise. I was familiar with the story of Henry Box Brown, an enslaved man who shipped himself to freedom straight to William Steele's office. So William Steele was there when that box was opened. And I already knew about Harriet Tubman. What I didn't know was that Harriet Tubman had passed through William's office many times. Um, and we know that because of the records that William kept. Now, with the passing of the Fugitive Slave Act, that made William Steele and his work, it, it threatened William Steele and his work because it was against the law at that time to help a person seeking freedom. You could be punished, severely punished. But William had a plan. He hid those records in a cemetery vault where no one would find them. And I want to end by doing a quick reading of the last page of the book. In 1872, he published his book, The Underground Railroad, a collection of stories of hardship and hairbreadth escapes. William Steele's records and the stories he preserved reunited families torn apart by slavery, because that's what stories can do. They can protest injustice, soothe, teach, inspire, connect. Stories save lives. William Steele's stories needed to be told so slavery's nightmare will never happen again. And I quickly want to touch on, uh, so that was my William Steele story, but I quickly want to touch on another book that will publish later this year, Swish, The Slam Dunking, Alley Ooping, High Flying Harlem Globetrotters, which is written by my friend Suzanne Slade and which will publish by, with Little Brown November 20th. And questions. So if my everything's going to work here, I'm going to try to stop sharing screen. Okay, that's not what I wanted to happen. Okay, stop sharing screen. There we go. Um, there you go. Okay. Perfect. We made it with a few technical glitches, but it worked. <laughs> we did it. We did it. Um, Don, thank you so much for that. And everyone, keep keep your keep your keep your claps going. Um, reminder: if you do ever unmute yourself for a question or to clap, you will be recorded. But that's fine with us. We're just glad to see your faces. Um, so my first question, and y'all, I'm encouraging y'all to to type them in the chat bar. We also can go live, and you can ask your questions out loud. Um, my first question is. So Don, we're living in a time where conversations about race are taking place regularly. If your books or characters could be part of that meaningful dialogue, what role would you want them to have? You know, I, I, I think that my books um, serve as weapons for fighting racism. Um, I'm a quiet person. Um, I'm not one to be out in the streets doing protests with signs. That's just not my personality. But I am doing my work. My books serve as my resistance. When racism tells a black child that um, you're powerless, I have a book for that child. Um, Ron's Big Mission, which is the story of Ron McNair, young Ron McNair, who desegregated his public library when he was told that he couldn't have a library card. He staged a protest and he made life better for future African Americans. When racism tells a black child that they can't be a scientist or that you know science is not a field that you can go into, I have a book for you. Whoosh, Lonnie Johnson's super soaking stream of inventions, which is the story of African-American scientist and inventor Lonnie Johnson, written by uh, a buddy of mine, Chris Barton. Um, when racism tells a black child that they have no history, I have a book for you. Carter reads the newspaper. 
um, which is the story of Carter G. Woodson, who set out to highlight the achievements of African Americans through his work. So again, I'm not a loud person who's going to be out on the street doing my protesting, but my books serve as my resistance. Thank you so much, Don. Um, Susan, do we have any questions from the chat? Yes, we do. Rebecca asks, what advice do you have for artists as they draw persons of a different race or background? I think that it is most, and it's kind of a boring answer to the question, but it's just important to draw every day. Draw people outside of your, of, of, of your culture, your race every day to understand the nuances of the face and the skin and, and also to get to know the people of the culture that you're, that you're illustrating. So that you're not just drawing from blank pictures on the internet, you're actually drawing from real life people that you know. Um, and to share your drawings, have them vetted with people of that particular uh, culture or experience. Um, and then most important, listen to the feedback that they give you. Thank you for that. And it looks like Carolyn has a question to ask out loud. Go ahead, Carolyn. Hey, um, oh wait, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear oh, you. Okay, it says I'm muted. Now I'm, okay. Um, so I had a question. I saw that one of your books is about uh, Sandow and yes. um, the archive I worked at before was the the Stark Center that has like oh yeah yeah and I think they maybe maybe you did a book signing there or there was something I feel like I remember hearing about your book but my I my planned question, a book signing there and it canceled due to the hurricane so I yeah oh so yeah. oh man um but so my my question is how like did you use do you use archival materials for references when you're working on your books? And how does that, um, you know, how does that work in, in writing uh, and creating children's books? Because I think sometimes people don't necessarily think about archives and children's books. But um, if you could talk a little bit about that, thank you. Well, most definitely, the archives most definitely inform the work that I'm with, that I'm doing with my books and in the and it varies from book to book but in the case of Sandow as I researched I kept coming across that name the Stark the the Stark Center for Physical Culture and I kept thinking that would make a really cool research trip but I didn't have the budget to make the trip and so I wrote the book and I revised it and then during that last revision, I thought, let me find out where this Stark Center is. And I Googled it and I learned that it's right here in Austin at the top of football stadium, right? And so I went there. First thing I did is contacted the librarian and told her about my work. And then she pulled out all of these really cool Eugene Sandow artifacts. So I was able to look at his magazine and read, the edit read his editorials. Um, there's, actual Eugene, there's an actual Eugene Sandow bust and at, during a bodybuilding competition, um, a trophy is given out. It's called the Sandow. They actually have Sandows at the Stark Center. So I went there. I spent many days just going through many primary sources. And then I went back and I, I altered my, 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 um, my writing. But yeah, I, I most definitely think that um, archives are so important. Even when, like I say, with the William Steele book, I went to Philadelphia and I went through the archives um, there studying the microfish. But I think the coolest thing was what happened afterwards. Earlier this year during ALA, I did a field trip to back, made a field trip back to the, the historical society and they had William Steele's actual diary there. So I was actually able to hold his diary in my hands. I was afraid it was gonna fall apart or something. Um, but yeah, hold, holding history in my hands. And then what we ended up doing that day, you talk about how, do, how does that, how do I, you know, parlay that into children's books? Well, his actual diary entry became the end papers for my William Still book. And because the diary is in the public domain, I was able to photograph it and then work it right directly into my story, if that answered your question. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Carolyn. That was a great question. And it's great to draw attention to how people can also do research here at the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. And Carolyn's actually one of our, our archivists and uh, we're glad that you're here. Susan, let's have another question. Sure, how about what is your creative process for the stories and illustrations? You touched on that a little bit. Can you go into more detail? So yeah, as a author illustrator and every um, illustr author illustrator is gonna work a little bit differently. Some illustrators like to begin with a wonderful picture and they'll put it out there on Instagram and the editor sees it and says, can you, I love that illustration. Can you build a story around that? I have several illustrator friends who that's how they go about it. But for me, I like to begin with the story so I will get inspired by a story. I'll do the research. I'll do my 40, 50 revisions. And then once I have the story that I feel is really strong, then I'll start to do um, the illustrations. And what I'll discover at that point, maybe I need to find a better process, but what I'll discover at that point is that the pictures now affect the words. The words are all messed up now. So then I go back in and I revise those words and now illustrations are affected. So then I'll go back and I'll revise the illustrations and then I'll just kind of go back and forth between the words and the pictures. And I honestly do that clear up until the book is going to be printed. Right now, I'm working on a book um, about football player Ernie Barnes and I'm driving my editor crazy because the book's done. I've already been paid for it, but you know what I'm gonna do this weekend? I'm gonna re-illustrate that last page because there's something about the text that isn't quite fitting to me. So I kind of do that, that, that back and forth dance clear up until the book is printed. So before we got on here, Susan had a great question for Don, and I thought Susan would be fun for you to ask it. Yes, sure. My question was, is William still the person who was portrayed by Leslie Odom Jr. in the recent Harry and Tubman film? Yes. And I was so excited to go watch that Harriet Tubman film. I couldn't even pay attention to the film because I was so I was so involved in studying the details of William Still. And you know, one of the fun things that I that I you know from that day was that after the movie, my wife was telling me that William Still was a sharp dresser, you know. And I and I remember thinking and telling her, you know, William Still was paid not paid much money by the anti-slavery society office. He was a fairly poor man, so he probably was not the sharp dresser that was portrayed in the movie. But yeah, I was so excited to, to be able to see that movie and um, yeah, use some of the visual research um, and put some of that visual research into my own story. Well, and that ties really well into the last question. You know, um, it's so, you get so much information, Don, and how, how do you decide what goes in and what doesn't, especially with William Still, because you're wanting to shape these characters for us on the page and how, what's your filtering process like for that? You know, with the William Steele story, it was very complicated because I wasn't sure whether this was a birth to death kind of a bi biography. Um, but then doing the research, I decided it couldn't be because his story really begins a generation before because his parents were enslaved. And those four children, those four older brothers and sisters were enslaved. And that their enslavement became the impetus to the work that he would do later on in his life. And so I had to include that in the story. And then I had the question of, because young kids might not even know what slavery is. I had to explain that. And then I had to explain the concept of the, of the Underground Railroad and what is all of that, you know, so that a young child would, 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 would understand. And then I had to explain the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. So I had all of these things, and how do I decide what things go into the story? Well, I try to figure out what is the big idea in that story? What is the big picture that I want the reader to walk away with? And in this instance, it was the importance of storytelling and um, preserving stories, and then passing those stories on to future generations. And so if that research um, fit within that arc, it went into the story, and if not, then it went into the back matter. Thank you for that, and we are at our time, but there is one last question that I feel like um, was pretty important. Susan, could you read that one from Lori, please? Yes, Lori asks, I would also like to hear about his books that are best for younger children. 
How would he recommend using his books to introduce topics of racism to preschool and younger elementary students? It's just important to have them in the classroom. Sometimes people have asked me or have questioned if certain books are appropriate for young readers. You know, with the, for instance, I have a book with my friend Chris Barton, The Amazing Age of John Roy Lynch, which is the story of an African American um, politician. Um, and I have a scene in the story where there's a church burning. And I have a scene in the story where an African American is being threatened because they're going to vote. But these are topics that are important to not hide from children because these are topics that are still happening today. There are church burnings happening today. Okay, there are conversations going on in homes today about the appropriate, you know, about um, Confederate monuments. So these aren't topics that went away years ago. These are conversations that are still happening today. So I just think that it's important to how do we introduce it? We have we have it's important to have these books in our house so that we can have these important conversations with our kids and not hide history from children. Thank you, Don, and um, thank you for writing and illustrating and for your your career <laughs> that's still going so strong. Um, oh, I love what I do. We love we love we love what you do too, and um, you know we have to wrap this up because these are thirty minute coffee chats, and so um, I'm going to do a few quick announcements, and then we will do our final round of applause. So if you guys like this one, we hope that you will keep tuning in um, because this was just our first season of the hashtag TX book chat series. So be sure to check out our next chat. It's actually on September 17th with Dr. Norma Ikantu and it's titled The Power of Stories. And we'll be sharing our new fall lineup um, pretty, pretty much right now, immediately on our website. So check that out. Um, so keep joining us. We love having y'all. Um, such a joy. It's so great to see friends and people that I haven't seen in so long and miss you and new friends of the State, State Library and Archives and um, the Texas Center for the Book. And so let's let's make sure we end on the note where the credit is due. Um, if you if you want to unmute yourself, you will be recorded, but you don't have to. Um, you can also do the virtual claps, but those that want to unmute yourself and give a big round of applause for Mr. Don Tate. Thank you so much, Don. Oh, thank you for having me here. It was such, such an honor, such an honor. Thank you so much. Any thank opportunity you. to talk about my work, I appreciate it. <laughs> we appreciate you. All right, y'all have a wonderful day and we'll see you at the next hashtag TX book chat.